So up uh, where I live, we say hi to lass, and that means good people. And you usually see that at the beginning of a talk. I'm very grateful to the organizers for permitting me to come and speak to you. This is the last talk in my formal career in that um, I'm retiring in September after 17 years service as the marine ecologist for a place called Guayanas in a place called Haida Gwaii. So I've had some people ask me, where's Haida Gwaii? <laughs> so uh, Haida Gwaii is a new legal name for the Queen Charlotte Islands since 2010. And so that's an archipelago off the north coast of British Columbia. You can see southeast Alaska from North Beach, but it's about 90 kilometers off the Canadian coast. It's right on the edge of the continental plate. That's where you had the big earthquake, because we're right at the very edge of the world, the Canadian world. <laughs> and I work for a place called Guayanas, and it has a long and complicated name, and I'll explain that. So Guayanas, the formal name is Guayanas National Park Reserve, National Marine Conservation Area Reserve, and Haida Heritage Site. That's our full formal name. And uh, that name is, uh, arises really from a, a longer story. I won't spend too much time on it. But uh, there was an act of civil disobedience on Haida Gwaii, led by the Haida Nation, the only uh, Aboriginal group of the islands, back in the mid-'80s. And it created, uh, well, there's a mass arrest and uh, tons of national press. And that, uh, the upshot was an agreement between Canada and BC to create a integrated land sea conservation area. That agreement was 1988. But the key agreement was uh, an agreement called the Gwaii Hannes Agreement in 1993. It was a Canada, Canadian first the first nation-to-nation -nation agreement for, for area protection. And it was an agreement between the Council of the Haida Nation and Canada. And representing Canada was Parks Canada. So that created the terrestrial component of this integrated dream. Then in 2010, we had a second agreement, the Guayanas Marine Agreement, that tapped the marine area onto the terrestrial area. And the Management entity created in 90, 1993 called the Archipelago Management Board expanded. It had been two Parks Canada, two Haida, two, two Parks Canada, one DFO, three Haida, 50-50, and the Archipelago Management Board makes all the decisions for Guayanas, and it's consensus-based. So that's the management structure behind the story. So for the last 17 years, I've been their marine ecologist. I did want to mention, uh, so you, you heard twice the word reserve. That's a very, very important legal uh, name in Canada. What it means is that a particular area has been created, but there is disagreement between the, the people in whose traditional territory that is, say Haida Gwaii, and Canada over final ownership and title. But having signed the agreement, agreeing to disagree on final title, we still go ahead anyway to create the protected area and to manage it. So it's been managed since 1993 by this uh, innovative partnership and then DFOs come in for the first time in Canadian history. DFO and Parks Canada are cooperating fundamentally in area protection in Canada. So it's another Canadian first. So there's a lot of uh, precedents, and what I wanted uh, to talk about is just to tell you a little bit about the story. Uh, I, when I heard about this meeting, I thought it's uh, a great, great idea because I, having been deeply involved in marine area conservation for a long time, uh, overall in Canada, as we all know, we haven't been making very good progress at all. And really, um, you know, Canada had two outstanding achievements, I think, in the 20th century. One of them was our uh, work with the United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea, because through our very effective work in the third conference on that, we, created, we uh, acquired a massive marine estate. And just how big it is, well, it's over 7 million square kilometers and, uh, of ocean space and 243,000 kilometers of shoreline. 
Also, uh, it includes the Great Lakes. And here's uh, one of the many wrinkles that we have. So, Parks Canada and Environment Canada and the U.S. government from their side include the Great Lakes in marine national policy. DFO does not. So here's just one of many wrinkles. Uh, when I first heard that uh, our first national marine park is called Fathom 5 and it was in Lake Huron. And of course I've been a marine biologist all my life and I kind of mocked that. Uh, but now I've changed my mind completely. I think it's brilliant to think of the Great Lakes and the conduit, the St. Lawrence River connecting it to the sea as one massive Canadian aquatic continuum. This does, two th this does a major thing for us. This puts uh, the major urban areas of southern Ontario and Quebec as coastal zone people. And uh, earlier today, uh, it was mentioned that Canada is not a coastal zone state, but if you include the Great Lakes, the vast majority of Canadians are coastal zone people. And so I think that that is a very important thing to, to appreciate that in fact the majority of Canadians live on the coastal zone. And this is, can be a route of engagement for them. So I mentioned the law of the sea. Um, so I wanted to talk about confusion because confusion is a big Canadian pastime. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so when you think about marine area conservation just from the federal, you have three agencies, Parks Canada, Environment Canada, and DFO. And each of them has two laws. So that's, now we're talking about six laws that are applicable for marine area conservation in Canada. But wait. Here in BC, for example, it's 116 of our 128 marine protected areas are provincial. So now we have another level of government. We have the feds with their six laws and three agencies and the aspirations for a national marine protected area network, but we also have provincial. In fact, the majority of marine protected areas in Canada are provincial, especially Quebec and BC. But wait, there are also municipal marine protected areas so that's a third level of government. White Cliff Park out here is a municipal marine protected area. But wait, there's also First Nations government, another fourth level of government. And right now, here in BC, we are going through revolutionary marine use planning on the north coast of BC, where it's been carved up into four chunks, and each has uh, rolled out its marine use plan uh, this last year. And it's just the province and the First Nations, not DFO, but nonetheless, this is very empowering for coastal First Nations that are the majority of, of uh, habitation of, of communities on, on the north coast of BC, First Nations. So this is critical. So what's happening now is the next phase, which is marine plan implementation. And that will include, almost certainly, First Nations proposed marine protected areas. So now we have all them laws, four levels of government, and we're, we've got to try and make sense of this, not only as professional people, but when we're communicating with the public. So no wonder the public is so confused about the ocean, about Canada, about the ocean in our na nation's destiny. And I think that, that what attracted me about this conference was that I think we've kind of stalled. We are kind of stalled as a nation, and it, we need to uh, much more engage the public it's the public that's really, really going to push forward the, the marine uh, conservation destiny for this country. You cannot rely on government for leadership. It's just not possible right now. <laughs> yeah. So this, the, the concern for me is that we have a very low public awareness of ocean issues still. And I think that that is a sacred mission that of this organization is to involve the public and I'm so glad uh, to, to be able to just briefly chat with you. So, you know, more science is not, not the solution. I mean, Canadian marine science is excellent and it's moving at light speed. In fact, as you saw uh, from Boris's talk, I mean, marine science has gone hyper-global. People can 
now access global data sets and make global analyses. This has only been possible in the last 20 years. I mean, there's been revolutionary change in marine science and marine science tools and tagging and geo-referencing information, you know, GIS and all that. So science is moving, it's got a life of its own and it's moving really ra rapidly and it's leaving behind the public, how can it not? But also policymakers and politicians. And the thing is that our politicians are not hearing from the public about uh, ocean reform. And as we all know, ocean reform has a very low profile politically in this country. And we've been criticized a lot. And uh, Boris showed some uh, that slide with our, our representation of uh, uh, fully uh, protected marine areas that we have hardly any, even in Guayanas, which the uh, Canada Gazette calls the highest level of marine protection in Canada because an NMCA, unlike these, all these others, is permanent. It's created by Parliament and can only be undone by Parliament. An MPA under the Oceans Act, it can be undone in 200 Kent Street. They can get together and just wrap it up. So this is a big deal. But when we established Guayanas in 2010, all we had was 3% no take. So that's a pretty small component of what is to be what is called you know the highest level of marine protection so all to say Guyana is certainly an increment of progress in Canada no question but we still have a very long way to go I would say our most difficult relationship would be with the fishing industry we get uh, good support from the public the Parks Canada is an agency with I work for the Parks Canada uh, is well regarded by the public uh, so we're, we're well accepted as, because, you know, we have this long tradition of terrestrial uh, conservation. I have some dates here. So Canada's first national park, Banff, 1885. First national marine park, Fathom 5, 1987. A century of Canadian history was the past before we get around to thinking about marine conservation. And if you think about our major ocean laws, they would be the Fisheries Act and the Oceans Act. Um, Fisheries Act was in force one year after con uh, Confederation, 1868. In fact, here in Canada, we have fisheries laws going back to 1807. There was a salmon ordinance in Upper, upper Canada. But in then days, people were concerned about fish conservation, but only from the human perspective. I mean, you conserve fish so you can have a fishery. And of course, we need to we are trans, uh, moving beyond that. Um, the last thing I'd like to say is that I really think that our Oceans Act was a remarkable achievement and it came from within government and it's pretty remarkable but follow-up, follow-up has been very very weak and that's because I think, it's the last thing I want to say, my sense is, well the politicians do not hear from the citizens about the ocean. If they do hear from citizens, it's usually Fisheries Act related issues, our ancient, powerful Fisheries Act. They don't hear about, politicians do not hear about gripes about the uh, Oceans Act very much. So we have a significant problem, I think. The way forward is the Oceans Act, and it's a, it's a remarkable piece of legislation, but our progress has been very slow, and I think it's up to the people of Canada now to step up and uh, demand that we have much more progress on a whole range of fronts, green area protection, well, just a whole range of fronts that the Oceans Act would enable. So anyway, um, thank you very much for permitting me to speak to you for a few moments. Thank you.